so we can do um, we'll just show a short video and then I'll land. for she innovate so uh, we would love to see you again not next week but the following week again uh, um, so just think this is the last time you're going to come here no we want you to come again and again and again and again right right That's yeah it. even if you're from the UK you just want to win. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so okay we, we wanted to get started but before we go you're not okay. um, so this is really in celebration of the second GICC which is the global innovation coalition for change meeting uh, which is tomorrow, and I am very proud that SAP are part, you know, of that of the coalition, but also leading the work around She Innovates. So Anne is our, our leader on that, and we've got a short video that will actually explain what She Innovates is and what we're doing with it. But we're very proud of the coalition, and I just I wanted to just sort of briefly mention what the coalition is and what our partners are doing. So we have uh, 25 partners across the private sector, nonprofit, and academic institutions. Everybody from LinkedIn to Facebook. MIT, I mean, we've got the full list on the wall as you walk in, of all our members, and the logos are on that wall, so you can see who they are. And effectively, it's, I think it's the first time the industry's ever done this, where we've come together to really try and make innovation work better for women and girls. How do we advance women and girls in innovation, and how do we make innovations meet the needs of women and girls? And so this coalition has come together, and they've identified what the barriers are, and what the work plan is to effectively address each of those barriers. And we plan on doing that over the next two years. And one of those programs is She Innovates. So what we're gonna do is play the video as a bit of an introduction to She Innovates. And if any of you have ideas on how you would like to get involved, please come and see Anne as the program. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome everybody, and we will start with our She Innovates video. In the United States, technology is the fastest growing industry. And yet, women comprise just 26% of computing occupations. How can women break into the technology sector? Where can they learn the necessary skills and meet like-minded individuals? Introducing the She Innovates app, made at SAP for UN Women. The She Innovates app will cultivate an online and offline community of purpose-driven female innovators. Designed to connect mentors and ambassadors to ambitious and innovative women, the She Innovates app is the platform to drive gender equality in the tech sector. 
With the events page, users can find local meetups, industry, summits, networking, events and more. To improve one's skills, the Virtual Skills School connects users to a catalog of videos on a range of topics such as design thinking and machine learning. The community page connects the user to the wider She Innovates network. There, she can join circles based on her location to meet local UN Women Ambassadors and like-minded individuals. The She Innovates app is brought to you by the GICC Partnership to achieve UN Sustainable Development Goal Number 5, Gender Equality. Join the movement, be part of the change. Hashtag She Innovates. Um, what is so in so so important when we look at that uh, video? Which actually is created by Gabi. Where did we have Gabi? Uh, she's one of the amazing women I have in my is. team. She's right down there. there is. Um, she put this together. Um, he said, well, if you think about it for two seconds, um, there is around seven seven and a half million, you know, seven and a half billion people in the world. And we know by fact that uh, half of those billion people, both of course women and men, today do not have access to internet. And that's one of the big things that was also discussed at Davos, how do we make internet for all? But even though that we get internet for all, how do we make sure that the women of the portion who do not have access to internet today, actually, when they get access to internet, actually will go and feel they are able to use the internet. And uh, what people believe is the case as it is right now, if we don't do anything about it, is that, so around four billion people today do not have access to internet. And if we say half of them are women, the people predict that half of them will not feel that they are enabled or skilled or know how, or maybe are allowed to go in and use the internet, for example, to skill themselves up. So the She Innovates have many roles and many purposes. We are here in New York, we're very fortunate, even though we do know that uh, in Silicon Harlem, there's also an issue with that people don't have access to internet. So you don't need to go so far away from where we are right now, where that issue is the case. But again, in New York, we are very fortunate, we have access to education, um, but even though you have access to education, you don't have access to education, the movement about she innovates is to make sure that every single woman in the world, no matter if you have access to, to internet, have access to education, no matter who you are, no matter what country and so, so forth, we want to be able to enable every single woman in the world. And that is why this video was put together and the app that you saw, which is our first prototype, is put together, more or less to say, in my pocket, I have what is going to enable me to be the most awesome innovation lady in the world. That's really what we're trying to do, to make sure that you're confident as a woman, whatever you want to become a data science, or you want to become a developer, or you want to build your own small media business, or you're a woman entrepreneur, I'm super proud to let you know that actually from one week ago, where I'm standing right now, Deepak announced that SAP IO is uh, launching a women accelerator for 30 plus women in this space that are coming in soon. Um, the thing about, that's also a thing that we want to enable women to become social entrepreneurs, to become entrepreneurs, but also to enable that we can actually have great VCs who is investing into women. So it's really kind of like that enablement tool to help any woman in the world to get a seat at the innovation table. That's really the old mission of She Innovates. Thank you, Anne. That was excellent. <laughs> and so thank you to Anne for all the amazing work that SAP have done in leading that particular work stream. We do, however, have an additional three other work streams that we'll be launching over the next 18 months. Some of them are dedicated to um, areas where women maybe don't have access to internet and how we reach those communities to ensure that no one's left behind. But also we want to drive consistency across the industry through things like our innovation principles, where we're talking about how companies can take a gender responsive approach to developing innovations. And we also then have a whole program, which will be very visible, um, that Facebook are leading around a 100 day campaign targeting women in innovation. 
that will give you examples, real life examples, of women who are innovating around the world. And that is a program and a campaign that we would encourage everybody to be a part of. You can even submit how you're innovating. And we look to share that globally and try and create a profile of an innovator that maybe challenges some established gender stereotypes that currently exist in the space. So we welcome every single one of you to be a part of this, either by starting your own She Innovate Circle, downloading the app, accessing the resources, or even sharing with us how your organization could maybe get involved in some of the work that we're doing. So feel free to speak to Anne and I at the end of the event. Tonight, um, we are very excited to have four thought leaders um, in the area related to innovation and technology, women um, and men, who are very dedicated to the space and have amazing stories and insights to share. So we have a, a four speakers, roughly about half an hour each. We'll allow sort of Q&As, just depending on how we go for time. And then we'll have some cocktails and pizza at the end. So it's a very relaxed atmosphere, and we encourage you all um, to participate and ask questions and, and get involved. We are live streaming this, so to the audience online, welcome to the event. And um, we thank all of you for being here tonight. So without further ado, I would like to welcome... Oh. No, I would like to welcome Faye Rancock to the stage. So welcome, Faye. So Faye is from Havas Media. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but Faye will be talking to us tonight about a very important topic, particularly related to technology, in terms of online sexism and um, online bullying. So I will hand over to Faye Thank to lead you. the talk. Thank you, Faye. Thank you very much. What an incredible space up here, I can't believe it. I've just, I came in on the plane from London and I arrived, the first thing I saw was the view out of this window. I was like, this is looking good. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, first of all, the first thing I want to say is thank you to Michelle and to the GICC and SAP for having us here tonight and asking me to come along and talk to you. The second thing I need to say is I'm sorry. Because what I'm about to talk to you about isn't very nice. The words and language and tone of some of the things that you're about to see might upset some of you. So, before we begin, if you're at all sensitive and don't like swearing, and sorry, it's very British of me, I'll do it lots, um, then you might want to go and get a drink and, like, you know, look at the view or something for the next sort of 15 minutes and then we'll come back and it'll all be fine and you can forget it never happened. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk to you about online trolling and sexism and the way we treat women on the internet. Um, so I thought what we might do, I've, I've recruited some ladies from the crowd to help me out. I thought the fir first thing we might do is um, share a little experience with you, which is some of the things that women are sent on the internet every single day. Take it away, ladies. That's right, Susanna. Peers can say, your mom looks big in that dress. And you say, thank you, Peers, for your honesty. At Katy Perry, short hair Katy Perry is such a boner killer. <laughs> At BBC Lorac, go away, you evil, nasty bitch. What I love about that one is she can't even spell feminist, the girl who wrote it. Okay, so, um, the scary thing about that is that those four messages, in the next 15 minutes, the women that we looked at in this study, they will receive that many of those kinds of tweets in the next 15 minutes. Every single one of them, every single day, every 15 minutes. So. The reason why you're all here is because you're all taking responsibility for creating an empowered culture, a place where we can talk about women, where we can advance women, and where we can be honest about the experiences we have. So thank you all very much for doing that. Um, the truth is, we need a cultural shift, a really significant one. The world is like this. Patriarchy still reigns, objectification is deep-rooted and rife. The internet, is a reductive, toxic, sexist place. It's really much worse than you think. <laughs> Trust me, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention, but it gives me sleepless nights. But there is some hope. The reality is the real world is giving us some, some things to look forward to. Um, time's up, 
Me Too, all these movements that have started to empower and understand and respect women, we just need to find a way to make them happen online. So, the challenge. I represent Havas. We're a communications agency. We're a global business. We carried out a social listening experiment last summer. And for six months, we looked at the tweets that 150 women that we identified in various power groups were sent, five different disciplines, and we analyzed them with some pretty sophisticated algorithms that look at language and sentiment. And we asked what they found. So before I start telling you about what we did find, I just wanted to give you a few examples. You don't need to read the list, so don't worry, nobody's like <laughs> the microscopes out. But um, there's quite a long list, obviously. There were five different groups, from global leaders and politicians to entertainers and athletes. And we used quite a few broadcasters, and quite a few of those are UK-based names, but they're still relevant for you guys in terms of um, over here. But they range from Angela Merkel to uh, Malala Yousafzai, from Beyonce to, I don't know, Gal Gadot and Serena Williams, and many more like them. So this is what we found. Of those 150 women, in a six-month period, they received 43,000 tweets each involving sexist abuse. That's 238 every single day. Like, I'm not being funny, that's terrifying. 238 tweets every single day. Every one of those women in just a six month period. So we, when we realized that the scale was that big, we started to categorize some, some of the things we were seeing. So we looked at different sections of the abuse to try and understand a bit better what we were seeing. So each of these groups relates to how the language was, uh, was understood and interpreted. And we'll, we can give, we'll give you some examples so you understand it a bit better. So the sexual harassment group is quite a large category and it involves any kind of form of body objectification. So it could be, what many might consider to be a compliment. You know, great tits, hashtag great tits today. Or legs, or a very, actually a very British one. I don't know if this means anything over here, but <laughs> mi hashtag MILF, which I don't know, no? Okay, yes. some people know, some people don't, okay. Or ask the person next to you, if somebody <laughs> nodded, then ask them, okay, because I don't want to say it out loud. Um, but there's quite a lot of this. Um, in, the, in the body objectification and sexual harassment category. And then we also had a huge amount of gender-specific slurs. Now, these are really classic and specific to women. They're like, she's a slag, bitch, cow, whore, that kind of stuff. It's just like trips off the tongue, so nice. Um, but there's a lot of it. And what we found when we started looking at specific women was there were certain women who were targeted with this more than others. Uh, one of the examples, actually, I think it was Michelle read out, which was Laura Koonsberg. Laura Koonsberg is the BBC's political editor. She's one of the most senior journalists in the UK. Uh, this is the kind of stuff she got sent. And this was in one day. I don't know if you, everyone could see that. Uh, evil bitch, silly slag, Tory C word. I'm sorry, I can't even say that one. My mother would turn in her grave. So uh, it was really vitriolic. It's really extreme. And this was just one day for a, a, this lady, Laura. So this is the overall picture, um, gives you a bit of a clue. We won't go into too much detail here, but it shows some of the key areas and where there was the most significant amount of abuse. So the sexual harassment and body objectification area is really significant here because most of the groups of women experience it. Um, this is where we start to have this debate about whether we're paying a woman a compliment. So if you get sent a tweet that says, great tits today, some people, including the man or woman who wrote it, would say, I was just paying her a compliment. I was just saying something nice about the way she looks. She should take that, shouldn't she? Let's imagine that's a complete stranger. And maybe it's not you, maybe it's your sister, or your mum, or your daughter, or your friend. And she gets 238 of those a day. And then we'll decide if it's still fair. So it's interesting to look at that and ask ourselves some questions about the way in which um, when, you write, excuse me, <coughs> when you write one tweet and you think one tweet is enough, what happens everyone else's tweets too? 
And there's also some other interesting areas here, which we'll look at in more detail, but it's worth noting that for the politicians in this, in this subgroup here, um, the largest, amount, the largest category for them is, is questions about their intellect and ability. It's really interesting that. When you can't stop talking too much about the way a woman looks, you have to find another way to really have a go at her. So this is really interesting. Happens a lot. So uh, we, looked at we looked at each of the groups, subgroups, and one of the things I wanted to mention with this one is the global leaders and, and this, this number here. I haven't mentioned this category yet. This category is really dark. This one really upsets me. So this is threats of sexual violence. So this is, I'm gonna come rape you in your bed. Or, or even nicer, I hope somebody else comes to rape you and kill you in your bed. These women are Hillary Clinton. This is the type of woman who gets sent a message like that 238 times a day, 22% of those tweets that that group of women received related to a threat of sexual violence. Entertainers are the most exposed group. Now this doesn't come as a huge surprise. It's like Taylor Swift has 85 million Twitter followers, so of course there's gonna be a huge amount of um, conversation going backwards and forwards. But what is more interesting is what happens here in this area with the, with the sexual harassment and body objectification area. I heard someone say to me the other day, well, obviously, because, you know, Tay-Tay prances around in her bikini in a music video. So obviously, she's using her body and her sexuality to ply her trade. So of course she's going to get them. She's asking for it, isn't she? So then I went back and I had another look at the women in that power group. I'm pretty sure Oprah Winfrey last time I checked, wasn't prancing around in a bikini. Neither's Emma Watson, neither's Angelina Jolie, neither's, I mean, the list goes on and on. There are 35 women in that power group. We looked at just them alone. Even if you strike out Miley Cyrus for thrashing around on a ball, there really aren't enough examples of that to make it worth even discussing. And also, I would question, if we're even talking about it, that means that we're giving it permission. So by even having that debate and questioning whether it's okay or not for her to own her body and make a music video of herself in a bikini and therefore it's okay for us to send her abuse, then we're giving that abuse permission. So it's about whether she owns her body, whether she's comfortable with it, it's her choice. It is not yours. So I think it's a really interesting debate for us to be having. I had quite an angry conversation with that person. Um, and this is where we get to the most depressing part for me. Um, when we started looking at who sent the tweets, there are as many women sending abusive messages to other women as there are men. In fact, in this category and this one, threats of sexual violence is almost exactly the same. So can you imagine? There's women out there sending messages to other women saying, I hope you get raped in your bed. I mean, I don't think I need to say that again, do I? Maybe I should. There are women out there sending messages to other women saying, I hope you get raped in your bed. Taylor Swift, bless her, love her, 65% of the tweets she gets are from other women. The abusive ones are from other women. This is the one we had earlier, the feminist who can't spell. I, I, this is the thing that really gets to me because, you know, we. We pay lip service and we talk a good game about the sisterhood and how important it is to us. And yet, we kind of do it to ourselves way more than we maybe even realise. We're conscious of, and all the times that we are judging one another, this all plays out on the internet without any filters. So in the moment where you think it's okay, because I might have thought it but I didn't say it out loud, so my filter's right here because I'm looking the, the person eyeball to eyeball, on the internet, those filters just disappear, and people feel it's okay to just say any of this stuff at any time, and it's okay. So why? The question you're all asking is why? 
Um, I mean, it's a million dollar question. And of course, there are uh, a huge amount of theory um, and a lot of research actually going on at the moment into why. But um, a recent report, well, it's kind of recent, not recent enough, I would say, in 2014, um, looked into why trolls troll. And there were three things that really stuck with us when we were doing our research. Um, desensitization, anonymity, and a lack of consequences. I think the desensitization question is really is kind of obvious, but the volume that we've just I've just shown you kind of speaks to that. Um, anonymity, we talked about tonight actually, I mean, before we started speaking, I was talking to Julie earlier about the idea, and Michelle about the idea that people just don't realize that because there's not another person right in front of you, it's okay to say whatever you like. And then obviously this like, idea of a lack of consequences is really significant. You know, one of the most important things we know as strategists who, who create behaviour change campaigns is that consequences are one of the most important factors for changing behaviour. So how do we make sure we create consequences? So, what do we do next? And this is where I'm going to finish, because I'm going to leave you with just a final thought, really. Um, uh, we've been investigating for a year now, and we've recognized the scale of the problem. But the next job is to do three things. It's to understand better, to carry out deeper and more thoughtful and more long-term research into why and the uh, environment that allows and enables internet trolls. It's to talk to technology platforms about how they control people's behavior it's to ask technology companies to take responsibility for their platforms and the ability they have to, to stop and prevent. And actually there are moments where we can, we can make people stop and change their behavior before they do something. But if we can't change behavior before it's done, let's protect those people from being the victims of it. And the final thing is our job as communication specialists is to agitate, is to make a campaign famous enough that people just can't ignore it anymore. And we hope that with the help of the GICC and, and the UN that we can start to do that because this is just too important for the sake of our daughters, for their daughters and for all these generations of young women coming up behind us who are looking at the internet and thinking it's a scary and dangerous place. Let's make the jungle either safer or let's equip them to be able to survive it better. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really shocking. I didn't warn you. <laughs> Sorry. But impactful. Before we start on our next talk and our next speaker, I just wanted to see if anybody's brave enough to ask me any questions. So oh, you're raising your hand. I mean, wine, wine, wine. Put one there. Uh, I don't have a portable mic. And do you guys have a fan, a mic that we can hand around? Uh, no handless, no hand-free mics. Do you got one? But this one has quite a long cord. Thank you for making um, that level of abuse so visible and gut-wrenching. Uh, my question is, when you present this kind of uh, data-driven um, information to the executive of a company like Twitter. How do they respond? I haven't, haven't uh, shown it to him yet, so uh, I'd be interested. Jack, if you're around. Um, uh, uh, sorry, thank you. Um, the answer to your question is a really good question, actually. Um, I think that everybody has the same reaction, which is, I had no idea it was this bad. I had no idea it was this pervasive. Um, and I didn't, I don't think, I, you know, I've heard anecdotally, but I didn't realise it was on a scale like this. So, um, I think the reality is a lot of the technology companies are, are aware that there's a problem, but are unwilling to do, to do the things that we believe they need to do um, to protect people online. The main reason for that is because if you think about Twitter as a platform or Facebook as a platform, it was designed to give people access to each other, to open up and to, um, you know, uh, democratize conversation. 
And if we start then putting filters and blocks and parameters around that, that makes them really uncomfortable. So it kind of questions the business model. So um, I think it's a really big challenge. I think it's really hard for them, but we would say we need to do something. good question and a really interesting one. Part of the research, which I, I didn't share with you tonight, we also did was on the media and the way the media represents women, um, particularly online actually. So in other words, the big media houses and how they, how they tweet and share stories about women from their own platforms. Um, that's pretty stark and worrying too, actually. And I, I don't think it's about anger. I think it's about permission. I think it's about the environment that allows, that allows people to behave this way towards each other. I think it's about the permissive nature of the way in which we talk about women collectively as a society. And actually, I think the media in particular is a really big, um, uh, has a really big responsibility in that department. Because if you just happen to start paying attention to, in the UK, there's a, a newspaper called the Daily Mail. And it's you know, a pretty famous newspaper for being pretty trashy. Um, and it has this thing which is, is known in the UK as the right-hand bar of shame. And it's this place where you can go to like read celebrity sleaze type stories. And every other story is about a woman and the way she looks. And whether she has great tits today. And whether she's lost weight or gained weight. And whether she looks good in a bikini. And whether she's hot enough to want for everyone to want to have sex with her. And it's kind of, that's just like daily fodder. So I think it's much more about the environment that people are in, which al that allows them and gives them permission to behave that way. And actually, anger just comes from being confronted. So each time somebody tweets something rude to JK Rowling, her response is to call them out and to take the mickey out of them. She laughs at them. She, tweets, she retweets their tweet and then she takes the mickey out of them. And the result is that then they get mad and then, you know, and then everything spirals into you know, horribleness. But I, that's a really big part of it, I think, is, is about how permissive we are and how we're giving people permission to behave this way. I was just wondering if you've heard of that app that was developed by the girl here in the US, which is a teenager, she was promoting it to teenagers in her high school so they can install it. And it does a language kind of reminder and it prompts you before you tweet you know, just to tell you, maybe you want to reflect on this before you, before you, it's an anti-bullying app. Wow, that's I got fantastic. a lot of press here. Yeah. Okay, well that's fantastic, because one of the things, that's yeah. really great, because one of the things we talked about, funnily enough, when we were um, meeting about this the other day, was um, two things. One was creating a plugin, which would you, allow you to actually view your social media through the plugin, and then it would redact, or black out, the words that it, it identifies as being language you don't want to be exposed to. Um, but then we also talked about giving people a kind of cooling off period and an option to say, before you send that tweet, maybe go away and, you know, have a think. Um, and I think that's a really, actually a really smart idea. I love that. So if someone can send me the yeah. details, I'd love that. Yeah, please. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, well, we're going to take one last question. Ruth, do you want to ask it? Yes. Yeah, so we're not talking about consequences of this behavior. I know Google had developed an app that is able to filter all the negative comments. So for example, if it's Hillary Clinton and you know, she doesn't have to see this, right? Or you know, we have some people that will impact on their confidence, for example. So you can prevent them from seeing this. So I'm wondering if we have any other good applications that can then yeah. not even just filter, but also exclude you from that community yeah. if you. So I think this is a really interesting part of the debate too, which is about social capital. I think for, for a really a prolific troller, or troll even, 
English. <laughs> English, anyone? Um, yeah, uh, for a really prolific troll, social capital is everything, right? So how many people view it and how many people comment on it is a big part of why it you know, kind of feeds the, the machine, if you know what I mean, the monster. Um, so one of the things we've talked a lot about is how you create consequences that don't dial up the fame factor for the troll, right? So one of the things that apparently there was some discussion within Twitter about was creating a red tick. So you know how you get a blue tick, a Twitter account is an official account, right? If you had a red twi tick account, it would basically mean that you were a scumbag and that nobody <laughs> should want to hang out with you online. But the reality was people were trying really hard to get red ticks. So it was actually creating this kind of, you know, horrible sort of, you know, cycle of creating yet more bad behavior. Um, so I think it's a really, you have to be really careful. I think there's a real minefield there between creating social capital and taking it away. So one of the things we've talked a lot about is being able to actually remove you from an audience. So you basically dial, you switch somebody's Twitter handle off so that then nobody can see them. But it's really not that easy to do. That's the reality. So there, there are big challenges, big technological challenges. But there's also a big behavioural campaign challenge here. We have to change the way society views this stuff so that it, it, comes off, it comes back offline and into the real world. Because that's when we start to confront behaviour face to face, eyeball to eyeball, whites of the eyes, crikey, I didn't realise I had hurt you that bad. That's when we change behaviour. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stage, our second speaker for the evening, Sarah Luxley from Minder. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Michelle, for having us here today. So I want to tell you about a day. It was a sunny day uh, not long ago, and I put on a powder blue graduation cap and a matching gown, and I stepped out into a sea of hundreds of fellow graduates. We were celebrating the culmination of our public policy masters at Columbia University and the air was electric. We were excited, our families were excited and our professors were so proud of everything we'd learnt and what that learning would mean for us in the future. And it was a really magical day. And at the end of that day I came home and I took off my cap and I put away my gown and I patted the baby bump that was hiding underneath it. Because I was 34 weeks pregnant that day and my daughter Ella would be born six weeks later. That day felt like a pivot point. I was closing the door on a time of learning and growth and stimulation and opening a new door to a time of love and warmth and connection, or at least that's what I thought at the time. And you know, it turns out that's what a lot of people think is the trade-off that a woman makes when she has a baby. A recent Princeton study found that when a professional woman has a child, her colleagues perceive her as warmer but less competent than before. I want you to let that sink in. Just the fact of having a child is enough to make a woman's colleagues see her as nicer but less intelligent than before. This isn't just insulting, it's also having a really a very real impact on women's bottom line. The pay gap between mothers and non-mothers is larger than the gap between women and men. A mother loses about 7% of her earning capacity for every child she has and can expect to make $11,000 less for a starting salary than an equally qualified candidate without children. And mothers are paid about 71 cents for every dollar paid to a father who just, by the way, is also a parent. Mothers are less likely to be hired. When they are hired, they're more likely to be passed over for promotion and to have less investment made in their development and training. This is keeping women back and it's driving women down. In America, there are 2.7 million families with a working mother who are living in poverty. And 2.1 million of those families are mother-only families. This motherhood penalty is something we can't afford to ignore. 
not here in the US, and not in the many other countries where this phenomenon exists, from the UK to Australia to Japan. One of the justifications that's sometimes made for this motherhood penalty is that all this time spent baby making and rearing takes away time that a woman would otherwise be investing in her development and her skills. And the formal term for this theory is human capital theory. Uh, but I prefer to use the colloquial phrase, which is hypocritical nonsense. <laughs> and let me tell you why. For one thing, becoming a mother is an unbelievably rich training ground for skills and expertise that every single employee needs. So while some people... So while some people say motherhood is the hardest job, I argue it's one of the best boot camps for any job. Because who knows resilience and grit like a mother who's rocked a screaming colicky baby through the night on the back of months with no more than two hours of sleep at a time and then gets up in the morning with a spring in her step because, well, that's just what mothers do. Who knows diplomacy and tact like a mother who's had to sit down with a young child and explain racism, or homophobia, or sexism, and still have that child walk away feeling safe and supported and like they could truly achieve anything they set their mind to. And who's more resourceful than a mother with hungry mouths to feed, who's staring down the constant churn of childcare costs while earning 7% less for every child she has. Motherhood gives us perspective and passion, flexibility and focus. It gives us humility and a hunger to achieve and provide and lead by example. In short, a mother is a ninja. <laughs> and a ninja is an asset to any workplace. United States Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg recently said that her career success has been not despite, but because of being a mother. Law and motherhood, she said, each provided respite from the other. They gave her perspective and a sense of proportion that many of her colleagues lacked. And she's not alone in feeling that motherhood has made her better at her job. A recent study by the Federal Reserve found that over the course of a 30-year career, Women with children actually outperformed every other class of employee at almost every career phase. There will be temporary dips, like when your kid licks the subway pole and then you're out of action for the next three months. <laughs> but overall, the evidence is in, and motherhood makes us better, not worse, at work. So that's why the motherhood penalty is misguided. Let's talk about why it's hypocritical. Despite all the sleep deprivation and the distractions, for many mothers, having a baby is a time of renewed creativity and a desire to learn and an entrepreneurial spirit. And Harvard researchers really recently explained this is in part because of an, an increased sense of altruism among new mothers, a desire to connect and give back to their communities during this transformational time in their lives. But for many mothers, when they go out into the world looking to harness all this creative energy, they find they're not welcome. And there's a few reasons for that. For one thing, as a society, we've conditioned ourselves to see breastfeeding and breast pumping as something that's dirty or distasteful, or in the case of some of our lead, of, in the words of some of our leaders, disgusting. We judge women for breastfeeding in the same breath as telling them that doing so is critical to their success as a mother. Another thing we don't like very much is noise. Not the raucous, excited kind of a toddler that's discovered something new. Not the fearful and questioning kind of a newborn in new surroundings. And not the kind that a mother makes when she's making everything okay. We find it distracting. We find it inappropriate. We think it should stay home. We expect new mothers 
to be unseen and unheard. If they need to congregate at all, it should be on a colourful play mat somewhere where they can sing about animals and talk about diapers like they're supposed to. And then when they come back to work, they should do it with no trace of this life-transforming experience they've just had or the tiny human that now defines them. We shun new mothers, we deny them entry, and then we charge them a motherhood penalty for failing to use this time to the fullest. So I come to you today with one big idea. It's that mothers have creativity, curiosity, compassion and capability that if harnessed would unleash a torrent of intellectual capital driving our societies and our economies forward. But only if we figure out how to use it. So what does that look like? Well, it starts with welcoming new mothers into our public spaces, our social spaces, our civic spaces, and our intellectual spaces. It starts with clean, safe places for them to pump. And just so we're clear, a toilet stall does not count. <laughs> it starts with private, purpose-built places for them to nurse if they choose that privacy, and being genuinely welcoming when they decide to nurse in public. It starts with changing tables in restrooms and with ramps for strollers. Now, if you're an, employ an employer, you probably already know where it starts, right? You know about paid parental leave and flexible hours and judging the quality of work product rather than FaceTime. You know about having a mother's room for pumping and about taking into account the needs of male and female caregivers so that we can all truly share the parenting load. But what you might not yet know is that you need to do these things not just because it's right and not just because it's important to the mother, but because it's the only way that you get to tap into this unbelievably powerful workforce that has been shown to outperform any other. For all of us, it starts with increasing our tolerance for a little noise in our cafes, in our classrooms, and even in our boardrooms. Because there will come a time for every mother where her childcare solution fails, and she's left with a choice between an important opportunity for her advancement and being there for her kid. So it starts with not making her choose. Now, I know some of you are sitting here feeling a little skeptical. You're thinking, you can't have a baby in a boardroom, that's ridiculous. Or you're thinking, new mums have enough going on already. They don't have time to think about intellectual and social and professional opportunities. So I want to tell you about a little experiment. It's an experiment that started in Brooklyn shortly after that graduation day I told you about. My daughter Ella was three months old, and it was the time of the federal election. And there was a weird energy in the air, in the playrooms and the parks. We were all still singing about animals and talking about diapers like we were supposed to, but there was an undercurrent, a bit of fear, some uncertainty, and a lot of ideas about what the outcomes might be and how we could get involved and contribute. So I booked out my favourite local cafe and I brought in a renowned political scientist from Columbia University and we had a talk, much like this one, but with 40 parents in the room and 40 babies. And believe me when I tell you there was noise. <laughs> but there was also a really engaged and productive political discussion. And everyone walked away a little wiser and better supported and a lot more intellectually and civically engaged. Now since that time, the experiment has turned into an organisation called Minder. We run talks, workshops, classes and events led by global experts where crying babies are welcome. We've had entrepreneurship workshops teaching people how to take an idea and turn it into a viable business. We've had climate change discussions and uh, skills building sessions on negotiation and advocacy and design, all with babies in the room. We recently took a delegation of 10 minder mums to a UN Women Conference to talk about uh, the future of female innovation. And we worked with the uh, organisers of that conference to create a safe and pleasant place for those women to pump. 
There's a radical change going on right now in the way mothers see ourselves and what we can do. We're reclaiming and reshaping our identities during this critical time in our lives. And we're saying, hey, you know what? Maybe becoming a mother has made me warmer, but you can bet it also made me more competent. So now you know the secret, which is that motherhood is not a penalty. It's an asset to the individual, to society, and to the economy. And it's very exciting for me uh, here today with you all to launch a project that we've been working very hard on, we've been working very hard on together with some other organisations that know this secret, including the wonderful entertainment industry advocacy group Mums in Film and the United Nations Foundation's Global Mums Challenge, which connects mothers all over the world with the work the UN is doing to progress the sustainable development goals. Now, I would tell you about it myself, but we've enlisted the help of someone who can say it much more eloquently than I do. I can. So without further ado, it's a delight to launch the world's biggest mama meetup campaign. I'm Sarah Michelle Geller, actress, <laughs> entrepreneur, and mother. At a time when we're seeing some incredible leaders forging a path for women everywhere, it can be easy to forget that the biggest change maker of all is you. Moms are strong, powerful, and we have more at stake than anyone else in creating a brighter future. So on March 8, 2018, I'm joining Minder and the United Nations Foundation's Global Moms Challenge to invite you to the world's biggest mama meetup. To join, you could get together with just one mom friend or plan an event for your whole community or organization and talk about how we can make the world better for moms and how moms can make the world better for everyone. Use the hashtag MamaMeet2018 to tell us how you're going to participate. Because mamas, we need to create a society that's fair, more inclusive, and creates opportunities for all women. And it's up to us moms to lead the way. That is awesome and Sarah does so much work on behalf of mums everywhere and as a mum, truly thankful for everything you do. So before we um, get on to our next speaker, we've only got two more speakers, uh, I just wanted to see if anybody's got any questions for Sarah. Any mums, any questions? <laughs> Maybe, no, they might want a drink. Oh, we've got one at the back. Do you want to come up and just, we need the mic for everybody online uh, who's watching. Oh, another question. Come to the front if you've got a question. Yeah, yeah just use this mic. My name is Ayesha, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm also a new mom, and one of the things I wanted to ask you is how do you then invite the other 50%? Because when I, I feel like in order to be a good, uh, a good mom and to participate in everything that you're saying, we also need a partner to make sure that we're also supported. So when I actually, when I found out I was pregnant, one of the things that I negotiated with my husband is his paternity leave. And it has to be equal to my maternity leave. It is, I'm serious. He's, I'm here right now because he's home taking care of our baby. Um, but that was very important. And, and he was, you know, my husband is already like a really woke man and um, he's, uh, he's awesome. I wouldn't have married him otherwise. But, um, <clears throat> But even him, like it took a few discussions for him to like get to the point where like he went from, yeah, I'll, I'll do one month to, I'm like, no, I want to share the caring of my child. Like there is that societal like click that has to happen and there were many discussions. So um, yeah, how do we involve them? Because we can't just do it alone. Or by ourselves. I think that's such an important question. Um, and kudos to you and your husband for the way well, you're tackling it. Well, the government it. is not going to do it. We have to do we it. We have in to our do home, it ourselves. Right? You're right. You're right. 100. <laughs> percent um, My incredibly woke husband is in the in the audience. One of the only people joining us here today. And to me, there's. It sounds patronising a little. Um, to our, our partners, but there's an educational element there around the work 
that is involved, the mental load that's involved, even when you're back at work, right? Yeah. The, the constant pressure to be across everything. Right. I think there's a bit of an, an educational piece there. And one question that um, makes me, makes my like skin curl that I really push back against um, when I hear it from anybody uh, is when I'm at home taking care of my kid uh, is, so what did you do all day? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be asked really innocently and easily um, and without any negative intention, but it, what it represents or can represent is a lack of understanding of what it means right. to be that person and the, the, the all-encompassing nature of that job and that load. And I think it has to start, all of it has to start from tackling that mm -hmm. because once we find a way as mothers who are still almost, you know, in, in most cases, either the primary carers or even when we're not the primary carers, those primarily carrying that mental load, right. until we tackle that, it's hard to get the buy-in, right? Because then it's like, oh, okay, you're doing me a favor to, to partake in this, or okay, I'm asking you for something and you're, this is a negotiation. Whereas if there's real buy-in to the idea that this is a job, that we signed up for together because yeah. couldn't have done it on my own. Uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> then <laughs> although, although, although now there are ways, but um, <laughs> but by you know, once there's buy-in to that element of it, I think the rest of it becomes easier. Now I'm Australian, as you can hear, and so it's also easier to answer these questions in a place where there is government support. So that's another really important piece. And that's something that we're aiming towards in, in future years of things like the World's oh, yes. Biggest Mama Meetup is, is mobilising the people that care about these issues to tackle some of those country-specific policy needs. Um, because, because I find, um, even now, some of the, the women's empowerment blogs and publications that I love, that I think do such a great job, will publish a piece celebrating some big bank or tech company because they just announced a paid parental leave policy and when you look at it, it's like the mother gets eight weeks and the, the father gets two weeks and that's supposed to be a really big win. And there's, there's a, a, an element there that we need to address where, yes, celebrate every win, every achievement, towards the goal is great, but I think we really need to be talking about yeah. the, the essence of bringing these two partners into more of an equal uh, responsibility, yeah. And Thanks. I think as women, I think that, I think it's in the same way that we're responsible for coming together as a community, that it's, you know, we have to do it ourselves. I also think we have to prompt that question to our partners and say, what can, you know, how much paternity leave are you gonna ask for, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And it starts with that question, and I'm, by asking that question, and it, if all of us do it, at some point, it's gonna get to those managers, right? Thank you. Okay, uh, I think that's all we have time for, but please um, touch base with Sarah. We've got drinks after the speeches and pizza. I think I see some people eating. So um, please feel free to touch base with Sarah because their organization are doing amazing things and uh, we all want to support you. Thank so you. please see you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stage, the wonderful Julie Hood from EY. So welcome, Julie. Thank you. And everybody can give her a round of applause. So Julie has actually come all the way from the UK, so you need to give her a break. She might be a little bit jet lagged. But she's going to be speaking about the future world of work, which is a really, really interesting topic. And it's one that's, um, that's dear to all of us. So there you go, Julie. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to add to the international flavour of the individuals that you've had up in front of me, or in front of you. Um, I have a bit of a varied accent, and um, a number of you would probably guess that it is also Australian, but um, amongst all of that is uh, an original New Zealander. Um, you can probably get it if I say six. Um, but um, I happen to do the cardinal sin. I married an Australian, and my children are English. So, so when it comes, for those that know the game of rugby, it gets very interesting in our house as you could imagine. Look, I'm absolutely delighted to have the chance to talk to you about 
the future world of work. But it's not from a perspective of technology or innovation, it's from a perspective of having the privilege of being in a senior leadership role within EY. I'm also a ninja, um, which, is, which is a lot of fun, uh, and actually keeps me humble. And I can also add to that list, it does make me a better person at work, uh, and I think work makes me a better mum at home. So the future world of work. Um, I get to sit in a boardroom with an EY of the top 150 executives across the globe. We're not a ridiculously huge business, but we're getting to sort of 32 billion. We have 250,000 professionals around the globe in almost every single corner of that diverse globe in which we sit. Why is the future of work important? As an organisation, maybe not unique to a partnership, but any corporation, we are custodians of the next generation. We need to make sure that the future world of work is on the agenda because how we shape the next generation, how we attract, how we retain the talent for the future is absolutely critical to the sustainability of our business and actually, quite frankly, what it does in the world. I also put my ninja hat on. In thinking about what my 11-year-old daughter and my 10-year-old son are going to be is something that me and their father think about on a regular basis. How are they going to contribute to this dynamic and changing world in which it's not the future of world of work, it's the today. What are they going to be? And quite frankly, they are going to be in careers that haven't been existing in existence yet. They're also going to be using technology that hasn't been existed yet. We then think about governments and economies from around the world. They have a scarce capital. They have so many issues to try and deal with. Where do they back the next investment in education, in social good? And they need to make some decisions around where the future world of work is going to be. And then fairly obviously, I'm also a woman. And if we think about the attributes, the core skills and capabilities that are not only on the table today, but we need to think about enhancing in the future as a woman or someone that is passionate about diverse minorities, we need to ensure that the future world of work is front and center in the debate. Now, none of us can deny the pace of technological change, but it's done a lot of things for us already, but it's potentially daunting it creates anxiousness in society, and potentially for many of us sitting in this room. How quickly will technology and disruption change the core attributes of work? Well, let's just think about the flexible working. Let's think about the fact that technology enables us to shift away from a culture where being seen in the office, or being there from beyond the nine to five, which in most environments does not exist. Technology has enabled us to play remotely, to shift away from that being seen to output driven. Now don't get me wrong, we have a very long way to go when it comes to assessment in most organizations because we have historically grown up in the world of being seen. So we have to challenge that. We need to understand how we reward and recognise people's capabilities based on output. But we also need to make sure that the flip side of that human instinct of social interaction is considered. How do we make sure that if most of our environment is working remotely with somebody online, how do we make sure that those core innate aspects of social gatherings are ingrained in us in another way? 
Technology is also creating significant changes in automation and artificial intelligence. And yes, there's a pretty interesting and fairly daunting side to that. But there are also incredible breakthroughs in predictive analytics around medical procedures. There's also incredible aspects around removing environments that are unsafe for workers using technology to do those jobs. We need to think and consider how all of these changes need to be considered in that future world of work. Our skill sets that we have today, many of them, some would argue almost all of them, in their technical positioning, may not exist in the future. There's papers, numerous papers, and believe me, I'm no academic at any of this, that talk about by 2030, 400 million, 800 million jobs will have changed. Now the reality is the world through history, through the industrial age, whatever it might be, has changed the face of the way in which we work. But what's really important is the conversation around the mindset. The mindset shift that we have to have around the characteristics of being able, about being able to excel in the future world of work. Now I've written them down. I don't normally hold a piece of paper, but I wanted to make sure I didn't miss any. And that is my name badge. I'm gonna change it to Ninja, and I'm a bit upset. I don't have a love heart on mine, so I'm, I'm feeling a bit left out. <laughs> so in just making sure that if we think about this mindset that we need to excel, possibly you'd argue today. I want you to reflect on these words and potentially some of the conversations we've had already from the stage and question, are these not skills and capabilities that you all have? Need to innovate, entrepreneurial, flexible, curious, collaborative, self-directed, willing to take chances, and people who understand there are many more ways to get an answer than just the one. I'm gonna add ninja, I love that. <laughs> now how important are those words with the way in which we're going to have to bring the debate around the future world of work, the discussion around the changes that are before us, but importantly, make sure that we play a role. So I'm gonna finish with, because I think the introduction to my discussion said also six words, so I think I've kind of missed that. However, I was recently, as a, a part of uh, an EY study at um, Stanford University, introduced to this concept of a six word story. And I think if it goes back, it, uh, it goes back to Ernest Hemingway, which was a challenge apparently he was given a long time ago, to be able to craft a story in six words. For those of you with young people in your lives, you should try it. I asked my 11 year old daughter the other day when she came home from school, she was gonna tell me her, her day and she, she kind of talks a lot. So I stopped her and I said, okay, New thing, you got six words. <laughs> she looks at me, and she often looks at me with yeah, stunnedness. And, but I said, no, you've got six words. And she said, and literally she reflected for what seemed like only 20 seconds, and it probably was shorter. And she goes, happy, happy, danced today, nailed it. <laughs> which, which would typically have taken her about 20 minutes to tell me that story, but... In those six words, it was just awesome. So I must say you should try it. But I'm gonna just finish with a story or a six word story of my ask for all of you. Because I have had an incredibly privileged sort of trajectory through my career, which has been extremely diverse and extremely challenging at many times. 
And I've had a six word story that I want to wrap around it. Dream today. Achieve, celebrate, next dream. But I'm going to elaborate. I left home and school when I was 16 years old. And I had a dream to be independent. And that wasn't a North Star dream. That wasn't when I grow up, I want to be a whatever else. It was a dream that was the then and then the now. And that wasn't easy. I left, I managed to somehow, I too, still to this day, wrangle a career as a junior architect in an apprenticeship, which was quite a long time ago. In doing that, I achieved my independence. And I celebrated. But I didn't just celebrate the stuff that went right. I celebrated what went wrong. I'm sure there are many of us, and probably most of us in this room, that have learned just as much about the things they've done well and they have gone right as those things that have not. So my ask to you is make sure you don't beat yourself up. You don't have that voice in your head saying, if only you'd stuck to what was safe. You make sure that you achieve and you celebrate. Ironic story, two years into my apprenticeship, there was a bit of a downturn in the architectural world. I think it was actually the first recession. I'd heard of these things, never experienced them. Um, and they made me redundant. And it came from, I was independent, you can't do that to me. Um, but it came from left field. And three weeks later they called me up and offered me my job back for twice the pay. And I very politely declined and said, I've just gone to a competitor for four times, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> So maybe there's always a silver lining when things don't go well. But the important thing is then there's a next dream. When I left and took that apprenticeship as a junior architect, I could have never dreamed. It was never on the horizon that I would be standing here today in such an incredible job that I get to do, working with an incredible set of businesses from around the globe and incredible clients in the market and which I quite frankly enjoy thoroughly. It was not even in my DNA, it wasn't in my psyche. So my ask is, as we think about those attributes that are going to be needed right now, think how many times we've had to be innovative. Think how many times you have had to take some risks we are always collaborative. But think how many times you have taken all of those attributes into your daily jobs, into your daily lives. And I ask you to figure out what is your six word story of how we make sure that not only do we have a seat at that table of the discussion, not only do we have a seat at that table in a role that is right for you, but we make sure that we create the next dream, you make sure you achieve, you celebrate the successes of that, you learn from the learnings that need to be learnt, and then you figure out what the next step is. Because if we are to truly create an environment and a society that combats the challenges that we have that technology is driving, that puts to good, not just the efficiency play, but puts to good the incredible technologies that it can enhance and challenge some of the world's biggest problems that we have, we are going to need to make sure that that seat at the table is not wasted. So I thank you for that, and I'm happy to take any questions anywhere. Before we get to our last speaker of the evening, I just want to see if anybody's got any questions on the future world of work or how to prepare for that for Julie. Yep, a question over here. Do you want to come up stage so we can oh, use the mic? I think it's you. Thank you for the amazing um, 
um, talk. I really had the great opportunity as well to interface with a lot of ENY consultants um, you know, to implement um, some of the most, you know, um, most largest um, business transformation systems. And you guys are like the top, you know, of, uh, so, uh, of the totem pole, um, obviously. Um, the only thing is that I was wondering, is there any data changes in terms of really um, helping women become more developers and not functional consultants? Yeah. Tricky. Right here. <laughs> yeah, no, and it, it's interesting. If we look at our historic recruitment practice, you know, we have historically been recognized as an accounting financial shop. We have to change our image and our brand in the marketplace to make sure that not only can we attract talent that is highly hard to get, but actually we retain it. And more importantly, because of who we are, because of how many countries we play in, we actually need to influence at the educational level as well. So so from a, for, so what, how we can tap into what is out there, absolutely. But I think more importantly, the firm is committed to ensuring that we work with the next generation uh, of STEM students because I think it's the computer science is one piece, but it's actually the broadening of that. And as someone that started their career, you know, in steel caps and, and, and pants, I must say I haven't gone back to them for a long time, um, then I think it's, it's phenomenal about the diversity we have at our business. Thank you so much, Julie. So look, um, if you want to ask Julie a question, please feel free to ask her. We've, we've just, um, I just want to be conscious of time for our last speaker. So thank you so much, Julie. And we do have drinks and food afterwards, so please stay to network and ask all the speakers questions, as many as you would like to. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Wade Davis. Welcome to the stage, Wade. <laughs> Very, very proud of Wade. Wade is actually going to be joining a UN woman in a few months to be working as one of our innovation champions. Uh, so there's a big announcement coming out on that and we are very, very excited to have Wade and all his work. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and I will let you um, yes, yes. take it away. Hi everyone. Um, before we start though, I'm going to embarrass her, but um, I just want to say thank you. You are a friend, you are a shero, and you are also a revolutionary. Um, and the work that you are doing is revolutionary. So I just want to say just thank you again for allowing me <laughs> So I, you're probably wondering, like, what is a man doing here talking about gender equality, right? Ah, I get really nervous. But I'm excited to talk ab about what is the man's role in gender equality? Um, so I do not come to talks like this and say anything that women should be doing. So you will not hear anything from me for me to tell you what you all should be doing because you've done enough. Um, so, and I was speaking, so I flew in from Boston about four hours ago because I was speaking at MIT. And um, the night before, a gentleman came up to me and he said, why are you so passionate about gender equality? And I said to him, I said, it's personal. And he looked at me and he said, oh, okay. But I could tell that he had no clue what I was talking about. So on my plane right here, I said, I need to change this talk a little bit and really explain like, what does it mean to make the work of gender equality personal? And I wanna start by reading a poem by Langston Hughes. And that poem says, in an envelope marked personal, God addressed me a letter. In an envelope marked personal, I have been given my answer. There's a reason that when there are events that are titled gender equality, that only women show up. It's personal. There's a reason that my partner who's in the back now, who works for EY, knows and talks so much about gender equality because the person who he's dating talks about gender equality all the time because it's personal. There's a reason that most of the books that I read are written by women and about women. Because if the work of gender equality is to become personal, I need to actually understand what your lives are actually like. Because when the issue becomes personal, something inside of you changes. But what does it look like to make the work of 
gender equality personal for men. How many of you remember the same-sex marriage movement, right? It was a relatively successful movement, right? But my friend, Kimberly Crenshaw, said the movement was successful because it was an intra-family movement. On Monday, a kid told his, his parents that he or she was LGBTQ. On Wednesday, potentially that parent rejected him. And on Friday, that parent loved and embraced him. It was personal. People had a chance to wrestle with these ideas. You get the chance to go back and forth and debate and talk about these ideas a lot. And because there's a deep and connectedness happened and the issue was personal, they stayed in it. For women, the issue of gender equality has always been deeply personal. But the question is, how do we bring in men? How do we get men to make this issue personal? Folks also ask me, why are you such a feminist? And I think to myself, well, I believe in the social, political, economic equality for all <laughs> genders, so it should be something that we all are, right? But often I talk to men, and they're really afraid of that word. And I thought back to, how long have I been maybe a feminist? And I remember when I was a kid, so I'm a southerner, I'm a church boy from Louisiana. I went to church four and six times per week. You know, like Monday was Bible study, Tuesday was prayer meeting, Thursday was you. I mean, we were in church a lot. And my mother, she sang in the choir. My grandmother, she was a deaconess. So they were women who actually had a certain level of, of, of visibility in the church. And I remember asking my mom one day, I said, Mom, why are there no women up in the pulpit? And she looked at me and she said, shut up, boy. <laughs> right? But to me, it didn't make sense. I was like, my mom is really capable, and she should be up there. And there are other women who are really capable, and why are they not up there on the stage? It just didn't make sense to me. But I had no understanding of the history of what patriarchy is and what it has, has done. I didn't know that my mother and my grandmother and people around her had wrestled for many years trying to, un trying to undo what had happened. So when I think about how we can invite men into this conversation, we've got to make it personal. Because my work is deeply rooted in bringing men along on this gender equality journey. Because men are often the gatekeepers to the corporate world. Because women, you have done the work. Folks ask you all to get mentors. You got them. Folks said, start ERG groups and get executive sponsors. You got them. <laughs> Folks said, make the business case for diversity and inclusion for gender equality. You made it back in 1980. <laughs> and it's 2018, and nothing has really changed. So it's time for us men to do the work, to walk alongside of you, to help to create a world that is more gender inclusive. Sorry. As I mentioned, I'm a feminist. But I have a confession. I'm also sexist. It's important for me to own that in front of you all today. It's important for me to own that so that you all can hold me accountable. Because every man that says he's a feminist should be on a one-day contract. <laughs> that every day I have to show up and prove to you that I am doing the actual work to create a world that is more gender inclusive. Because if I'm not doing that, then what am I actually doing? Chimamanga Adichie in her brilliant TED Talk said that kids are impressionable. And when growing up with a single story, oftentimes those stories stay, stay with us. So as a boy, I had no clue of the ubiquitous and sinister nature of patriarchy. I didn't really understand what was happening around me. It took me many years to understand that patriarchy was actually being done in my name. Patriarchy was being done in my name. And if I was silent about it, I was giving it tacit approval. But I'm really lucky now. I have the best job in the world. I'm a former NFL player. <laughs> former NFL player. 
So I have a new dream. I get to work in the corporate and sports spaces. I consult for the NFL, the NHL, for Google, a lot of other spaces, and I get to partner with the UN. And guess what my job is now? I get to sit in rooms with men and talk about gender equality and sexism. I get to have intimate, vulnerable conversations with men about a topic that they have yet to really ever wrestle with. And I have a secret for you. They're dying to have the conversation. They want to have the conversation. And I learned how to do my work a little bit better talking to men about gender equality. I had to become disinterested in being right. I also had to become disinterested in thinking that I was a good man. Because we use that language all the time, right? Well, you know, but I'm a good guy. <laughs> Women don't care. <laughs> Men, what are you actually doing? <laughs> Women don't care. They're struggling under the weight and the oppressive nature of a patriarchal system that is actually trying to destroy them. And I'm thinking often about us men when we say things like, oh, I became a gender equality advocate after I had a daughter. That's benevolent sexism. Because that's disrespectful to every woman that has come before you that you have met in your entire life. So we have to continually make this work personal to men. So how do we do this? How do I do this? Because oftentimes when I'm talking to men about gender equality, they go, man, come on, it's not that bad. I say, are you reading any books? <laughs> and I ask men, I say, how many books do you have on your shelf? And they'll say, oh, about 50. And I'll say, how many books are you reading per year? And they'll say, well, you know, 10 to 20. And I'll go, how many of those books are written by women? <laughs> and are about the lives of women. Because I am tired of men telling me, I had no clue that all of this stuff was happening to women. Where have we been? Where have we been? We have to read and understand your lives in order for us to understand how to show up every day. We have to make this work personal. We must make this work personal. Because when you make the work of gender equality personal, we stop asking for the business case for diversity and inclusion. Because we understand that women are more than data points on paper. We also understand that there's never been a business case made for men to be leaders. It just is. <laughs> When the issue of gender equality becomes personal, we as men understand that we use the same language to describe why women shouldn't be in leadership as when they wanted the right to vote. We say things like, well, you know, women don't really understand business or don't have the disposition to be leaders. We said the same thing about when you wanted to vote. We said things like, well, women, Women don't, you know, like they want to be mothers more than they want to be leaders. We made the same argument when you wanted the right to vote. When, when men make the issue of gender equality personal, we understand that as long as women are oppressed, men will always be oppressed too. That our destinies are intertwined. Bell Hooks, she's my... She's my Shiro. I met her once. It was just one of the greatest days of my life. She, she teaches us that the work starts with those most marginalized. And those of us who have the least. So if you are a man, the work must start with women. The work must start with black women, with trans women, with differently abled women, with immigrant women. And then when you get that and you work your way up, you get everybody. You get everybody. I am honored to take part in partnering with the UN. It is a privilege that I get to have talks with men about these issues. So I've built a six session training program for men, where the first two sessions, we actually deeply tangle and wrestle with these ideas. 
And I get to hear men say to me, well, you know, I'm afraid now because of Me Too that I can't take women out to lunch. And I say, how many women were you taking out to lunch before the movie? <laughs> And I say, what are you actually afraid of? And they say, well, I'm afraid that something's going to happen. I say, no, what you're actually afraid of is that women aren't capable of, of discerning between inappropriate and inappropriate actions. That's what you're afraid of. And they get to go, hmm. And then I push men, and we get to ask them better questions. And on the third session, I bring in women to share their stories where men are finally listening in a captive audience, and they have to show up with questions. And then after that, we get to reflect, and again, wrestle more. And then we get to partner with women, where we start to come up with real tangible solutions and actions in our corporate space and in our personal lives. But women aren't responsible to do the work we are. You're just there to guide us and say, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> But the work has to be done by us. Because as I said, you've already done the work. You've written the blogs. You've written the books. If we just read them, we can understand how do we align our passion for gender equality with our purpose and with our values. And then we can figure out tangible actions to take steps. We can start to understand that if I have a fantasy football league with all the men in my office, I've created an informal mentoring system. I can understand that on Thursday nights when I go out for drinks and there are no women there, I've again created another informal mentoring system. It's the work of men to educate other men about everything that you all are experiencing and everything that you've already done. So again, Michelle, thank you so much. Allow me to be your partner, and thank you all for tonight. <laughs> woman and Wade made me a bit teary, so good job. Men don't deserve to be praised either or, or applied. We just gotta do some damn work. Brutal, <laughs> brutal. Okay, so what I thought we'd do is have some, some questions from the audience and, and then we can break for drinks. So who would like to ask Wade? Oh, okay. <laughs> if you could come here just for the people um, online just to use the mic, that'd be great. Thank you, Ben. Hi, I commend you for the work that you're doing. Question is, we're also raising young boys into grown, woke men. And um, what are the opportunities to do something to educate and free the minds and influence their perspective on the role and the responsibilities they have as they grow into these men? Um, so th that's a brilliant question. The first thing that I would say is that we've got to start letting young boys read books that are not about sports or about men. You know, like, I was never given a book written by a woman, ever, right? And that would have changed my perspective. Um, also, we, start, we have to start having conversations with our sons about sexism and misogyny and all these actual things at young ages at the same time as we're having a talks about racism. Also, we have to not define the term what it means to be a man. As long as we define what it means to be a man or what manhood is, there will always be someone who can't live up to that type of a definition. And we have to expand that and allow boys to, to, to play with dolls, to, to, to have an actual stove, right? Like what's interesting is that like the most famous chefs in the world are men, but as boys, we never get stoves to play with. You know, so if, if, if we start to, you know, I'm wearing this shirt, raise boys, and girls the same way. And that, I think, is a start. To start doing the same things that you would do for your daughters, do with your son and vice versa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Please come to the front. Um, just help with the online. You can just start a live right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone who has a question? Yeah. Um, my first question is, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but my second question, and I also um, 
relate very strongly to what the woman here said, and um, I'm curious about the role of fathers in raising their sons, because I feel like even the responsibility of creating the next generation of woke men is put upon mothers, and so how do we um, get our male partners to help become caring, warm, compassionate fathers who um, will play with dolls with their boys. Yeah. So I think one of the first ways is we have to start having these types of conversations with our partners, right? So my partner and I may or may not have kids, but we talk about these ideas all the time, right? Like, I'm sure he gets sick of me, you know, saying, did you read this article this woman wrote, right? You know, but, but I think that we have to, one, from the time that you start dating, like ask your partner these questions and make sure that your values and their values align. So that once you know, you're, you're having that actual child, you've already done the work so that you know that your partner is going to take the same type of leave that you are. And your partner is, is, is gonna have the same types of conversation with your son that you will. So, we, we, we as, as adults have to make sure that we are al aligned or that we're equally yoked with our partner so that the work is not only on the woman, that the man is excited to do the same type of interrogation work that you will. Yeah. Thank you. My question is actually very much along those lines. My husband was a management consultant who flew out every Monday morning and flew home every Friday afternoon. And, <laughs> and I'm wondering if in sort of the sanctum of those rooms or sanctuary of those rooms where you said people are very open and can be vulnerable, I'm wondering if the men ever say, hey, I really wish I could have been home on a Thursday night and gone to my kids play, or hey, I wish instead of my wife staying home with the sick child, um, I could have stayed home today with the sick child. Do they ever confess such things as opposed to the women pushing them in? <laughs> so there are some men who have actually said that they feel bad that they're not there. Um, but I, I have not had a man who actually has said that, right? That, um, that I wish that I was there instead of my wife. What I do hear men say is that no one is actually creating the conditions for them to take the risk to be honest about how they actually feel, right? So when I'm doing my work sessions with men, I only ask two types of questions. How questions or what questions? I don't ask why questions because why questions typically feel like judgment, right? But if I'm asking you a what question or a how question, you actually have to be specific with the actual answers. And then now I can find ways to connect with you to to walk with you on that journey. This, the sessions I do with men, I call them slow dances with Marvin Gaye on, right? <laughs> right? That, that we're dancing and they're gonna step on my toes and I'm gonna step on their toes, but my goal is to keep the conversation going and to challenge them in ways that they haven't imagined. The amount of men who, when I tell them that when they say that they've had a daughter and now they're advocates, and I say, have you heard of the term benevolent sexism? And they go, no, what does that mean, right? And, and then we talk about that, and then they understand because it's put in a way that they can hear it. Now, I want to be completely honest. Because I played in the NFL, it gives me a certain level of social capital, so I also have to unpack that. I also have to unpack the fact that they're not listening to women, you know, and, and it doesn't do any good if they will only listen to me. Right, so, so I have to also be really intentional to own my own privilege and challenge them in those spaces so that when we're having these types of, of events, they're filled with, with men. I mean, I mean, like imagine this room was filled with men. A lot of the issues that they were having, we'd be like, wow, we're on a right path. But, but right now, we haven't figured out how to grab them and how to make it personal. Last question, please. Oh. Everyone's so stylish. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about personal relationships um, because I feel that a lot that the way uh, a man treats his partner um, also has an effect on the way he acts um, when it comes to business or even the way he sees his partner if he feels that he has to be dominant or if he's abusive or if he was witness to abusive parents um, or even if he is being abused um, personally. So do you ever dive into um, their personal relationships and how that is affecting them in the workplace? So 
the first and second session, our goal is to dive into their histories, right? To, to understand what, what has happened in their world, in their, in their past, to make them show up in the way that they are, right? So it, it's a way to get them to, to connect their, their current actions with their past. And when, when you can connect those actual dots and men can have those aha moments, right? And you do it in such a way that, as again, it feels like a, like a nice kind of slow dance, they come back wanting to, to, to talk more. Um, here's a quick story. So um, I try to also create conditions for men to, to, to find accountability coaches, right? So, so one of the things that we do is like, can you find a woman or a man in, in your life to hold you accountable for your actions, right? So I have a team of, of people who I work with and I only hire women because studies say that companies that have more women at the top are more successful, so why would I not listen, right? Um, it's just the truth, right? And, and I'm partnering with the First Lady of New York City on an initiative and we're on the phone with my team and I'm like, oh my God, the first, I mean, the mayor's wife called me up and I'm so excited. And my manager said, who? And I said, the mayor's wife. And she was like, who are you talking about? And it dawned on me, she is not just someone's wife. She is the first lady of New York City, right? And so by, by connecting it to men's past and, and then also giving them ways to be held accountable and do it in, in ways where you're calling men in and not calling them out really creates the conditions for us to figure out how to make things personal and then find actions. Thank you. So we're going to break um, now and sort of end our evening. I'll just invite Anne to the stage. Reluctant Anne, come on Anne. <laughs> I just want to, um, before we close, just to thank all the speakers. Some of them flew in from the UK to be here tonight. Julie, thank you so much. And Faye is back there. Um, it was really amazing to listen to all the speeches and to listen to all your questions. I know you've got a ton more and I'm really sorry. I'm just trying to end on time so that you know you guys can meet each other and network and enjoy the drinks and enjoy the pizza that they put on. So a deep thanks to Anne. Um, all the work that I do I would not be possible without Anne. Um, Anne has not only been a partner in terms of She Innovates, but she is a true champion for gender equality. And she literally supports everything that we are all about at the UN. So I'm really proud to have Anne as a partner. And I just want to thank you so much, a work partner. And thank you so much for being here. Um, just to round that one up, uh, I, I need to, of course, thank my incredible team. Um, where is Sandra? Where is Sandra? She's right there. Up, Sandra. Uh, Sandra is... Uh, my partner in five, I have Lilia, I have Greg, I have uh, Johanna, I have, I mean, my team is, um, I couldn't do this without my team, it's not just me, it's just the team and me, it's always the team. Um, what I want to say, um, which is always surprising me, because I said we do this every second Wednesday, um, and um, uh, Sinet that we have right here, uh, which one is one of my, you probably don't know that, which one of my key role models is that this is actually something that SEP, in the DNA of SEP, we are bringing out globally within the company and into this huge SEP ecosystem that SEP represents. Um, and it all starts with a conversation because I, I think that some of the things that you will take away from tonight and what we try to do every second, not Wednesday, Thursday here, and we try to do in our entire ecosystem all our events we have around the world, all our many locations we have around the world, we bring women and men together to have those super important conversations. And it's all about the different perspective. Uh, and what I always say to people is that when you come together, and, every, and this is the three rules that I live through, everybody have a voice, silence, and reflection. If you do that, you begin to sink in and understand what is happening around you. And when you begin to understand what is happening around you, you begin to change and you begin to respect other people. And th this is why conversations like this is super important. And we want you all with the Sheenovit movement to be ambassadors of what we're doing. Uh, because to the point you talk about, and you all are probably thinking about, is that it, the change starts with yourself. It's first when you begin to change 
and you and and that you can actually drive a change and be up and look at the change around you. So therefore, um, I. I'm very touched by the conversation in here, and I'm always so surprised to see that a topic like this here that we have around here innovates. Um, we keep, we need to keep talking about it, but we also need to do something about it. And this is what I see now. People often ask me, "Why do you think and that something is going to change now?" Because we are in a very special time right now, and everybody's saying that. So we will see the change. I am totally optimistic that that change will happen now. And I am, I'm also even, I look at all the 17 global goals, what is the DNA of the SAP company? I am 100% sure, and I think that's a big thing to be sure, that we will reach the 17 global goals because we are in such a specific time right now where people really think about purpose that is, things are bigger than ourselves. We need to do something, and that's why I'm, Super thrilled that we can do something cool with you and women and Michelle. And thanks to you and thanks to the whole GRC. I know some of the members here. Maybe we can get some of the members, the members who's here, some of the GRCC to stand up. I know some of them are here. Some of them are coming in tomorrow. Uh, not all of them not coming yet, but they're coming tomorrow. It's it's not just my work and your work. It's the whole GRCC. Uh, and uh, but thank you for letting us be part of this. No, thank you so much. Amy. Thank you. Enjoy the drinks and please network and meet all of the speakers and ask them questions and let me know how you want to get involved. Speak to Anne and myself about She Innovate. Feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. I've been doing a lot of 